Welcome to Preservation for Community Archives, a training session developed by the Community Archives Skills Support and Sustainability Project, funded by the National Lottery Heritage Fund. I'm Robin Sampson, the Community Archivist for the project. And I'm Laura McCourt, Community Archives Project Manager. This session will provide an overview of how to care for your physical collections. It will also feature advice from Nick Selwood, Senior Conservator at the Norfolk Record Office. By the end of this session, you will understand the importance of managing the conditions in your storage area, learn how best to package collections and what to prioritise for packing, learn how to handle archive items correctly and know how to create a disaster plan. We'll cover a lot of ground and we'll offer advice of where to start for improving your current situation and what to prioritise. What is preservation? Preservation is the process of trying to slow down the deterioration of archives through a combination of good policy, storage conditions and packaging and handling. It's different to conservation, which refers to the procedures required to repair and treat already damaged material. Deterioration in the long term is inevitable. It's an ongoing process and you will not notice it on a week by week or even a year by year basis, but nevertheless it is happening. The storage area. Start by looking at the building in which the documents are stored. If it doesn't have stable conditions, this will make things more difficult for you. Aspects to consider are light, temperature, humidity and airflow, mould, dusts and pests, fire and floods, security and disaster planning. Light, whether sunlight or artificial light, causes archive material to fade, discolour and become brittle. So it's important to keep items in storage areas with minimal exposure to light. What you can do in order of priority. Keep items in boxes and or other packaging to add a protective barrier. Cover windows with thick curtains, blinds or window film. Ensure lights are positioned at least 30 centimetres away from shelving to avoid heating up the materials. And switch lights off when the room is not in use. Our conservator, Nick Selwood, will now offer some advice about preventing light damage. Light, especially sunlight, is one of the things that can damage books and documents. We've all seen faded photographs, and this is a classic example here. This uh, is a picture of my colleague's daughter graduating university in 2006. So this photograph is less, less than 14 years old, and you can see how badly the image has faded. That's because this was next to a window. So how to avoid that? Well, basically, you need to keep your documents in the dark. Light damage is cumulative. So what happens is the, the, the light damages it starts to fade, but putting it in the dark doesn't reverse that damage. It just stops it from getting worse. Every time it comes out into the light, it gets worse and worse. Ideally, if you want to display documents, then you should display a copy. You should put it on a wall that is not facing the window. Uh, if you could put a cover over that document or that display, that also reduces the amount of light that gets through to it. We store everything in a dark strong room, usually in an enclosure, which again keeps out the light, and only look at it when we actually need it. Temperature, humidity and airflow. High temperatures cause materials to deteriorate at a fast rate, whilst humid conditions allow mould to thrive. Rapid changes in temperature or humidity also makes the fibres in different items expand and contract, which leads to photographs and papers warping and curling, and also causes ink to flake. In an enclosed space, air can stop flowing, which can lead to a build-up of gases released from stored materials and pockets of stagnant air can become breeding grounds for mould. Keeping the storage area's environment stable will help to reduce some of these issues. 
Heritage organizations constantly monitor their environmental conditions. Current standards recommend a room temperature of between 13 to 20 degrees Celsius and 35 to 60% relative humidity. You can buy a basic thermohygrometer to measure these figures for about 10 pounds. An example product is pictured on the slide. It's a good idea to regularly record these statistics so that you can monitor extremes and fluctuations in temperature and relative humidity. For the purposes of your community archive, the most important things are to make sure, firstly, that your storage area is cool, dark and dry prior to storing your collections. And secondly, that you can maintain these conditions during its ongoing use. A few days outside of these ideal ranges shouldn't cause problems, but continuing high or low temperatures and humidity will. So how can you help with temperature, humidity and airflow? In order of priority, avoid housing archives in attics, basements, garages, conservatories or sheds. Ideally, the storage area should have thick walls, few or no windows and a solid roof or ceiling. These will all help to shield the storage area from changes in the outside environment. If storing in a house, a spare room may be the best option as the heating and lighting will not be used as frequently as in the rest of the house. Keep shelving units away from radiators or from walls adjacent to kitchens or bathrooms. It is also best to keep items off the floor and not directly touching the walls as they will be vulnerable to damp. A dehumidifier will help keep the space dry, but should not be left on when the building is not occupied. There should be space between the top of the shelving and the ceiling, and between rows of shelving, to allow the air to move. Fans can keep the air flowing around the room, but again should not be left on when the building is not occupied. Avoid leaving any doors open other than for access, as this can affect the temperature of the storage area and keep any windows closed for the same reason. However, on occasion, it may be necessary to open doors and windows temporarily because of high temperatures. Mold, dusts and pests. These all pose particular threats to the lifespan of a collection. Mold thrives in warm and damp environments and can spread between items, often causing irreparable damage. Dust is abrasive and attracts moisture, leading to a risk of mold growth, and pests such as silverfish will feed on material like paper and glue, which will damage the structure of your records. What you can do in order of priority. If you find any items suffering from mold infestation, it is vital that you isolate them from the rest of the archives. If they are still damp, they need to be dried out. You may wish to seek advice from a conservator. There'll be links to further resources on mold and how to deal with it at the end of the presentation. Regularly dust and vacuum the storage area to reduce the buildup of dust. If maintenance work is required, cover the collections in plastic sheeting to protect them from dust and debris and do a deep clean straight after the work has been finished. To combat pests, always keep food and drink away from the collections. This is the best way to reduce pest activity and to avoid accidental spillages or other contamination. If you hold any social activities such as coffee mornings, keep these in a room separate to the archives. You can use sticky insect traps to monitor the level of insect activity in the storage area and decide whether any action is needed. There are some websites dedicated to helping identify pests you find, such as What's Eating Your Collection. Fire and floods. Fire and flooding are two of the most devastating risks to the safety of your collections. What you can do in order of priority, make sure you have a working and regularly tested smoke detector or fire alarm in your storage area. If you have fire extinguishers, make sure people know how to use them. Never keep collections in proximity to open fires, gas heaters or exposed wiring. Box up as much of the collection as you can, as boxes will provide initial protection against fire and water damage. Ideally, keep the items in a room above the ground floor. 
Ensure there is a gap of at least a few inches between your shelving unit's lowest shelves and the floor. These actions will ensure some delay against the effects of flooding. Shelving units should ideally be made of metal to help protect them from fire and also from pests such as woodworm. Do not keep archives in rooms where there are exposed pipes, boilers, open drains or water tanks. Security. When storing collections in a public building, decide who and how many people will have access to the storage area and how you will keep it secure to protect the collections from theft and vandalism. What you can do in order of priority. Ensure the storage area has a lockable door and agree a list of key holders from your organisation. Record all items removed and returned from the store. Leave a retrieval slip in place of the removed item, noting what was moved, who moved it, and the date it was moved. To minimise the risk of records being lost, you will need to keep a list of where each item is currently held in the storage area. Specify the room they are kept in, and give each shelf a unique reference number that can be added to an accession register and the catalogue, so that records can be located easily. It is wise to store sensitive records or records that have been closed at the request of the donor in a more secure area, such as a safe or a lockable cabinet. Disaster planning. Despite all your best efforts, there may come a time when there is an emergency that threatens the safety of your collections. Thinking ahead will make sure that everyone knows what to do and to minimize damage. A disaster plan is simple to access and use in an emergency, sets out the actions required, details who is responsible for which tasks along with their contact details, lists which items are priorities to secure and make safe and where they are kept. When writing a disaster plan, assess the most likely risks and draw up a plan to help recovery after a disaster. Take any action you can to address the risks beforehand without waiting for a disaster. Get to know your storage area, including switches, valves and stopcocks for utilities. Include a list of key holders. Assess these by proximity to the archive store. List the addresses and telephone numbers of people who can be contacted in an emergency. And again, assess these by proximity to the archive store. Ensure you have a list of what's in your archive and where it is kept. Identify priority collections or items to inform what to salvage first. Identify the space, equipment and materials needed to salvage. Know where to get it or have certain things prepared on site. Identify where the archives could be relocated to, another part of the building or a separate site. Remember to review and update your plan if anything changes and store the plan in multiple locations. The following sites have useful resources for creating disaster plans. The Scottish Council on Archives has detailed guidance and templates to develop an emergency plan which cover preparation, response and recovery. You can pick and choose what suits your circumstances. The Rapid Response Network also has downloadable plans, handouts and forms to help. The Museum of London's Pocket Salvage Guide gives instructions on salvaging according to types of material. Your disaster plan will also need to record the immediate steps to care for your archives after an emergency. There are four key activities for the salvage of damaged objects. Firstly, salvage itself, that's rescuing the material as quickly as possible. Secondly, is sorting. Uh, an allocated space will be needed for this task. Thirdly, is treatment, such as air drying. And fourthly, is stabilizing or packing for freezing. This is for items that are thoroughly wet and cannot be air dried immediately. Remember that different materials will need different actions. Salvage actions. Deal with the instant and liaise with emergency services if needed. Activate your disaster plan 
by calling out your emergency contacts, carry out an initial damage assessment and take photographs, assess your priorities, set up an alternative storage area if needed, begin your initial treatment, and document and remove collections to an alternative site if required. In the particular case of fire, prioritize wet items initially. When all wet items have been salvaged, you can turn your attention to smoke and fire damage. Ensure that all fragments are gathered and kept with the object. Get advice from a conservator over treatment options. Smoke residues can be removed through careful cleaning, but you should seek advice about how best to do this. In the case of flooding, any material which is in boxes, drawers or enclosures should be checked immediately. It may be that the contents are not yet wet. If so, remove these into a new box or temporary crate together with the original box label. Do not attempt to separate sodden clumps of documents. Place documents face up, flat and on blotting paper to dry. Keep books as found, whether open or shut. Ventilate items to dry. One way to do this is to set up a wind tunnel, as shown in the diagram. Assess whether any items need freezing if they are too wet to be air dried immediately. Do not allow photographs to dry in contact with another surface. Lay loose photographs flat and face up. Fan out photograph albums to air dry upright. We've looked at environmental factors and now our next section will consider shelving, packaging and health and safety. Good shelving is important to protect the collections from adverse environmental conditions and to ensure items can be located easily. What you can do in order of priority. Shelving should fully support the collections stored on them. Boxes of archive materials can be very heavy, so ensure the shelves can take the weight. Collections should be stored on open metal shelving, which is secured to the floor and ceiling, but not fixed directly to exterior walls to avoid damp spreading. Open fronted shelving is easy to access for inspection and cleaning. If you're storing the archive in cupboards or filing cabinets, ensure they are opened regularly to circulate the air. Glass fronted shelves protect against dust, but can seal too well, containing humid air and providing a greenhouse environment. Drill ventilation holes and cover with gauze, or leave doors open a little. If you don't have metal shelving, store boxed material or bound volumes in wooden shelving or cabinets that are preferably sealed with a water-based varnish. Unvarnished wood can give off acetic acid, which causes chemical damage to archive materials and can make them deteriorate faster. You may want to consider MDF, which is a board made from wood fibres bound with resin and is commonly used for building storage units. Zero formaldehyde MDF is recommended for wooden shelving as this does not release emissions that may cause damage. Here are some examples of bad packaging to start. This is often how things will be given to you and I'm sure these will be familiar sights. Things bundled up with ties or string, put into bin bags or overstuffed boxes. All boxes and folders provide initial protection from light, water, dust and grubby hands and ensure related records are kept safely together. Consider using conservation grade materials for more effective long term preservation. Be aware these will be more expensive than regular materials. Office storage boxes often contain material that affects the long term safety of collection items. For example, cardboard boxes contain acids that can damage their contents over time. The plastic sleeves in photograph albums can degrade and produce a sticky residue that can damage photographs. Working to a budget, the most effective use of resources is to prioritise irreplaceable items. Draw a distinction between two categories. Category A, items which you've copied from an archive or library or which are publications or something you have multiple copies of. And category B, original documents or copies of documents where the original is in private hands. Use conservation grade materials to package category B items and regular materials for category A items. What you can do in order of priority. Where possible, use conservation grade packaging, which includes acid and lignin free boxes. Lignin is a chemical in wood pulp that can cause paper to degrade over time. 
conservation standard boxes can also provide some protection against sudden fluctuations in humidity or temperature. Office packaging can be used initially to provide some protection against damage, pest and lights. However, it should be replaced as soon as you have the resources to do so for items in category B. Ensure boxes are appropriately sized and the documents fit comfortably. Do not overfill boxes so they break or become too full to handle. Ensure the lid is resting on the sides of a box rather than on top of the contents. Avoid folding items to fit packaging. Instead, get packaging which fits the item. It's okay to keep existing folds. Use polyester sleeves from a conservation supplier for photographs, slides and transparencies as this material is clear, strong and chemically inactive. PVC plastic sleeves will degrade over time and damage their contents. Albums with polyester pockets as pictured are far superior to sticky back varieties. Negatives should be stored in sleeves and placed in an envelope or folder. If you need to write on prints, use a soft 2B pencil on the back and press lightly to avoid embossing the surface. Do not use pins, sellotape or any self-adhesive tape, rubber bands or standard paper clips. You can use brass paper clips, but even with those there is the possibility of damage to the document or the one next to it. So place a protective piece of acid-free paper underneath if you're using those. Roll large maps and plans around acid-free cardboard tubes to avoid them being crushed in storage. A synthetic fibre sheet called Tyvek can also be used to wrap rolled items to protect them from dust and water. And for added extra protection, you can roll corrugated card around this to shield the edges. Store hardback volumes standing upright. Avoid storing them at an angle as this will put strain on the spines and do not pack them too tightly on the shelf. Oversized volumes, A3 size or larger, can be stored horizontally to put less strain on the spines. We're now going to play two short videos for you. The first is Nick talking about packaging photographic material and the second is on the different types of enclosures. We store photographic material in polyester sleeves. Again, these come in various different sizes uh, and you can see the thing with photographs is you should never touch the photographic side, the, the bit with the image on, that can damage it. So you either need to wear gloves uh, or if you've got it in polyester then it's protected. Polyester obviously is also see-through which means that you can see the image. We buy lots of different sized enclosures which come separately or you can get a filing system like this. This box comes with ring binders and you can see that these uh, pockets will hold either two photographs or some that hold more than that. These hold uh, four per page. You can get them with to hold slides or in fact these ones which will hold negatives. This ring binder system holds everything together and keeps it safe. If documents are in contact with acidic material that can damage them the acid migrates from the poorer quality material into the document and can cause damage. We've all seen newspapers that uh, once you have them out in the light, they start to go a bit yellow. And that is the acid in the paper, which is starting to make that difference. Hopefully, you can see on here, the brown marks is where it started to go the acid has started to burn into the paper. A worse example of that is this book here. And hopefully we can see that the edges of this have become very brittle. And again, this is the acid in the paper which is making that deteriorate and it makes that, those edges very, very fragile. So you can see that handling this material roughly would cause it to fall apart. Actually, on this, there's also, you can smell the acid in the paper, not on the film there. So the way we overcome some of that problem is by storing things in acid-free materials. So we've got various different things that we use. We've got these envelopes, they come in various different sizes, and they're from acid-free paper. 
They're quite high tech these envelopes. They've got no licky sticky bit on the top here, on the flap. Uh, and these bits where it's joined here, the seams are on the outside of the envelope. What that means is that when you're putting your documents in and out of the envelope, um, the seams don't catch and don't cause any damage. And should the envelope ever get wet, then that adhesive won't stick to the original document. We also use these four flap folders. So named because they have four flaps. These will hold a single sheet of paper or because of these creased lines on here means you can get anything up to about two centimetres worth of documents in here. Again, these are made from acid-free board and will protect the document. Going one stage further, we make acid-free boxes. We can make these to any size that you like. There is an order form on our website. Listed are some suppliers of conservation materials. On the right hand side, you can see the different categories that are covered. The Norfolk Record Office can make custom size archival boxes on request. Consider the health and safety of everyone who has access to the storage area. What you can do in order of priority. Risk assess your storage area for health and safety issues. The suggestions here may not be exhaustive. Keep heavier items on middle shelves. This means you do not have to stretch to pull them off high shelves or risk straining your back by lifting them off lower shelves. When transporting records, only carry one box at a time. For bigger loads, use a trolley if possible. You may need equipment to access items on higher shelves, but never stand on a chair. More than one person should be available to move large, bulky and heavy items. The last section of our presentation will focus on making use of the collections. Aspects to consider include handling techniques, using retrieval slips, copying documents and displaying documents. Collections are kept so that they can be accessed and used in the future. Unless copies are made, they are likely to be handled frequently, which can lead to deterioration. So what you can do in order of priority. Paper is relatively robust and if handled correctly, can survive for a long time. When handling paper, you can use your bare hands. They should be clean and dry. Do not handle records if you are wearing sun cream or moisturiser. Use a soft 2B pencil rather than pens for making any notes so that ink doesn't transfer from your hands to the paper. When handling photographs, Polaroids, transparencies, film and magnetic tape, it's best to wear gloves as salt from your fingertips can react with chemicals on their surface and cause discoloration and staining. Ideally, you should wear medical grade gloves as they provide better dexterity and grip. Cotton gloves are not recommended as they have fibres that may get caught up on the documents. They reduce manual dexterity and need regular washing as they get dirty quickly and you can also end up transferring dirt from other pages. If you don't have gloves, handle with clean dry hands and avoid touching the face of prints except by the edges. Assess items for any weak or fragile points before moving them. Hardback books should be placed on a book cushion or similar support to protect the spine when opening. Pages, maps and plans should be held down with soft weights. Some holders of digital data, such as CDs, can be affected by contact with the skin. Carry CDs by their rims and avoid touching the data side of the discs. Keep digital media in their cases when not in use. Ensure the workspace is clean and don't drag items across tables. Don't run your finger along text when reading and please don't lick your fingers before turning the pages. When you temporarily retrieve an item from your storage area for use by a member of your group or by a researcher, it's a good idea to record its removal using a place marker known as a retrieval slip. This ensures you can keep track of the items in your care and acts as a deterrent against theft. A sample retrieval slip can be downloaded from the Community Archives Toolkit. 
You can retain the retrieval slip so you have information on what collections are being used, by whom and how frequently. This may help you when making decisions about copying material. For example, if original items are used frequently, it may be a good idea to make copies to give out to your researchers to preserve the originals as much as possible. It also lets you know what research topics are popular with your researchers, which may inform your future collecting. So how does it work? Either a member of the community archive group or a researcher should fill in their name, the date of retrieval and the reference number of the item retrieved. Cut the slip into two and keep one section with the retrieved item. The other section should be kept in the item's location. Once the item is returned, marry up the two slips again and file them with the date. Keep a regular tally of the items that are retrieved as this information can be used to inform preservation and collecting policies and priorities. Here is an example retrieval slip which is available to download from the Community Archives Toolkit on the Norfolk Record Office website. A good way of ensuring archives are protected is to make copies of them, particularly items that are regularly requested by researchers. Copying ensures the originals are not overhandled and can increase and diversify access to a wider audience. Digital copies can be displayed or shared online, and physical copies can be displayed in exhibitions. No form of copying should cause damage to the original item. For example, putting documents through the rolls in a photocopier risks damaging them and never disassemble an item to get a better image unless you can very easily put it back together exactly as it was. Use a flatbed scanner or a digital camera to copy original items. Consider the format of what you want to copy to decide the best method. Does it need special handling or equipment to support it, such as a book wedge or weights? Consider the size. Will it fit comfortably on a scanner or does it need to be photographed? For more details, see the digitisation guide in the Community Archives Toolkit. Public display is a great way of raising awareness of your archives, but can provide some challenges to the preservation of displayed records. What you can do in order of priority. Display copies of items to avoid damage to the original, especially photographic material. If displaying original documents, ensure they are properly supervised and or displayed in locked cases. If the use of originals is unavoidable, minimise their exposure to light, for example by covering them up outside of opening times. It's best not to store volumes open for long periods, and you should change the pages selected for display regularly. Any handling should be done in line with the principles covered under handling techniques. Here's our preservation checklist. Undertake a preservation survey of your current collection storage, noting down areas where you're already doing well and areas which need improvement. Where improvement is needed, itemise what can be feasibly done with current budgets and resources and the areas that require extra budget or resources before they can be improved. Make a priority list of areas that need immediate intervention to prevent damage or deterioration and focus budget and resources on improving these. If needed, seek further advice by posting on the Norfolk Archives Network Forum. Here's a list of useful websites and videos you may want to refer to for further guidance. Just as paper and photographs need to be preserved for future use, so does digital material. However, digital files require more active management as there are many factors that can affect them. See the digitization section in the Community Archives Toolkit for further details. Gloucestershire Heritage Hub have produced some helpful things to watch out for. The Scottish Council on Archives have produced extensive notes and the Digital Preservation Coalition offers a free training course to provide beginners with the skills required to develop and implement simple digital preservation workflows. Thank you very much for watching. 
there is an in-depth reference section on preservation on our community archives toolkit. You can find this via the Norfolk Record Office website. Take a look at the Norfolk Archives Network Forum to connect with other community archive groups. If you have any questions, please feel free to contact us via the forum. We have a short feedback survey in the link beneath this video. This is really helpful for us to pass information onto the National Lottery Heritage Fund. It shouldn't take more than a few minutes. If you could please click on the link and fill it out, it would be much appreciated. Thank you again for watching.